as analysis of alkenes is the major synthetic approach we are going to use when we need to cut through the carbon-carbon bonds. And while this reaction has a rather complex mechanism, there is a simple trick I am going to show you that will allow you to draw the azanolysis products easily from the first attempt every single time. But before we jump into any tricks, let's take a proper look at the mechanism of the azanolysis. The first step is technically classified as a 3 plus 2 cycloaddition reaction. In this step, ozone adds to alkene, forming a five-membered ring that we refer to as the primary ozonide or just malozonide, which stands for molecular ozonide. This species is quite unstable and will most likely explode if you attempt to isolate it. Luckily, we don't have to isolate it. Malozonide decomposes by itself in situ, generating a couple of interesting-looking species. One is a simple carbonyl, while the other one is going to be a very reactive dipole. This dipole is going to quickly react with the carbonyl compound, reforming a five-membered ring. This molecule is technically called 1,2,4-trioxalane, but we commonly refer to it as an ozonide. And while this is a significantly more stable species than molozonide, we are still not going to isolate it and we are going to proceed to a workup step right away. Now, before we jump into the workup step, here is an example of this mechanism with a real molecule. Pause this video if you need a little bit time to work through it. Now, when it comes to our workup steps, that's where things are getting interesting. There are two type of workup steps that we are going to see in the ozonolysis reaction. The first one, the reductive workup, that's going to make aldehydes and ketones depending on the structure of the starting material. We typically see dimethyl sulfide, DMS, which is a molecule that contains sulfur connected to two methyl groups, so we see either DMS or zinc and acid as the conditions for our reductive ozonolysis. And the important feature of the reductive workup is that it preserves the hydrogen that you might have had in your molecule, making an aldehyde. So in my case here, I had a hydrogen to begin with, and we have preserved that hydrogen in our aldehyde. Now, when it comes to our reagents, DMS or zinc, which one should you use in your class? Well, for our purposes, they are actually interchangeable. So use whichever you like more or whichever your instructor likes more. The first one, DMS, dimethyl sulfide, is very effective and equally as stinky. That reagent reeks. The second one, zinc and acid, well, that one is very clean, very simple, but unfortunately it's a little bit moody and it is a little bit picky about the zinc quality and its freshness. So if you were to do that in the lab, you'd go with whatever limitation you personally are willing to deal with. Personally, I don't mind the smell of sulfur organic, so I don't mind using DMS a bit. Now, the second type of a workup we are going to see, that is the oxidative workup that's going to make carboxylic acids uh, instead of aldehydes. We use aqueous hydrogen peroxide here for our reagents, and there are no variations. It's typically just going to be hydrogen peroxide. Now, one other thing that I want to point out here real quick, just because you can make a carboxylic acid or just because you can make an aldehyde in reductive workup, up, doesn't mean that you have to make carboxylic acid and aldehyde. Everything is going to be dictated by the nature of your starting material and nature of your alkene. Maybe your alkene will only make ketones, maybe it will make two aldehydes or two carboxylic acid. It really depends on the structure of the molecule itself, so you gotta pay attention. You've also probably noticed that I'm not talking about the mechanism of either reductive or oxidative as analysis, and that's for a reason. The thing is, we don't usually cover the mechanism of those workup steps in the sophomore organic chemistry course at all. So, typically, you'd be only responsible for the formation of the ozonide intermediate, so the first part of this mechanism all the way up to the workup step. But in my experience, some instructors skip even that part. In any case, if you need to know the mechanism, make sure you practice your curved arrows here a few times so you don't make any silly mistakes on the exam. Now, I promised you a simple trick to derive the products, right? Well, here we go! Let's take the same starting material I've used for my mechanism. So, in order to draw my product, I'm going to follow a few simple steps here. First, I'm going to redraw my molecule, but while I'm redrawing my molecule, I'm going to redraw it with a ridiculously long double bond. So, I will have something like like that. I will redraw my bottom part here just as is, and then when I get to my double bond, I will draw that very long, something like that. And then I will show the rest of my molecule. 
the next thing that I'm going to do here, I'm going to take my eraser and I will erase the middle of that double bond just like so. Then I'm going to take and put oxygen here and another oxygen there. And there we get it. We have our product. So whenever you need to draw those products, just go ahead, redraw your molecule, draw it with a very long double bond, erase the middle of your double bond, and you get your product. Now, the important thing here to pay attention to is the nature of your workup. So here I have DMS, which is a reductive workup, which means that the hydrogen that I have on my alkene, well, I'm going to be preserving that hydrogen and nothing is going to change to it. But what if I had, let's say, the same starting material, but now instead of a reductive workup, I have hydrogen peroxide, which is the oxidative workup. Well, in this case, I'm going to take this hydrogen hydrogen that I have on my double bond and I will convert that into an OH group in my final product. So the steps are going to be the same. I'm going to redraw my starting material, one, two, three, and then for now I will show this hydrogen. Then I will make a ridiculously long double bond, draw the rest of my molecule, grab my eraser, get rid of the middle portion of my double bond, put the oxygen one, oxygen two, but now I remember that I need to take my hydrogen that I have over here and I will convert that into the corresponding OH group. So now, instead of an aldehyde that I had in my uh, example above, I now have a carboxylic acid. Remember, those hydrogens are not always going to be shown, so if they are not shown, it might be a good idea to double check if you have those hydrogens or not. So for instance, if I have a molecule like that and I I'm doing ozonolysis of that, and again my second step here is going to be the oxidative ozonolysis, while well, I'm going to be cutting through my double bond, but look, this carbon on the right does not have any hydrogens on that, and this carbon on the left does not have any hydrogens on that either, which means that the nature of my workup is actually majorly unimportant to me, it's uh, irrelevant. And when I'm drawing my product, I don't have to worry about any hydrogens, so I will just show the same molecule with the long double bond, then I will grab my eraser, get rid of the middle portion here, put one oxygen and second oxygen in there, and there we get it, we have our product. Now, there are a couple of common mistakes that I see students make all the time when dealing with the ozonolysis. And the first common mistake is mistreating the cyclic alkenes. Well, let me illustrate what I mean here with an example. So let's say we have this cyclohexene molecule over here, and we're doing the reductive ozonolysis of this molecule. Ozonolysis cuts through the double bond, so we're just going to be cutting through that double bond. And one thing that I often see a lot of students do is that they will just cut through the entire molecule, breaking it in two. And while we do often indeed see our molecule being cut in two molecules in a Zenolysis reaction, that's not always going to be the case. Here, the double bond is a part of a cycle. So while I'm indeed going to be cutting through my double bond, the rest of the molecule is going to be intact. Think about that as, I don't know, cutting through a hair tie, for example. So you have your hair tie over here, and you are cutting through the uh, one side of the hair tie. Let's say we are going to make a cut over here. Well, in this case, if I make that cut, I will take my eraser. Well, I didn't make two different molecules. I didn't make two different uh, pieces of elastic here. It is still one piece. So it's exactly the same deal with my molecule. Here, I started with the whole molecule, which I cut in the middle, which means that at the end, I'm also going to end up with a whole molecule and the edges of that molecule are disconnected where I cut through my double bond. If it helps, draw a line through your alkene and then uh, take a highlighter and highlight the chains from one carbon of the double bond to another one until you get to your line again. So what I mean here is that once I have my red line over here, I can draw a continuous line until I meet that red line again. And the rule here is that you just cannot cross your red line and this way you will know how many pieces you end up with uh, in your final product. So for instance, in my next example, I have two double 
multiple bonds, but I'm still going to end up with only one product. I'm cutting through the double bonds, but I'm keeping the rest of my molecule connected. So if I'm using my highlighter trick, then I will start from one double bond, I will go through my molecule, until I uh, find the red line and I can see that at the end I should still have one continuous piece. In my next example, however, I am going to end up with two products. So in this case, I am actually cutting through the molecule and using my highlighter trick here, I can trace one piece and I can trace the second piece as well, just like that. So always pay very close attention to your molecule rather than just mindlessly break it into pieces during the azanolysis reaction. And another common mistake I see is when students erroneously add extra atoms or groups to your molecule. Let me give you an example here. Let's say I have the following reaction in front of me. Many students would see this reaction that this reaction is an oxidative ozonolysis and they remember that the oxidative ozonolysis tends to give carboxylic acids. So they just mindlessly jam that OH group into the product. And you might think that that looks ridiculous. I will never draw something like that. And you are right, it is ridiculous. But I kid you not, I saw this happening tens if not hundreds of times in my career. You see, when you are taking a test, you are maybe a little bit nervous, maybe at that anxious, and it's easy to make mistakes like this one. So I want to point it out now, so you'll be less likely to make this mistake in the future. And similarly, when you're dealing with a fairly large molecule, it might be a very good idea to number your atoms to make sure you don't miss any or maybe add extra ones uh, by mistake. So for instance, let's look at this example. It's a big and scary molecule. I have a couple of double bonds over here. so. When I am cutting through this molecule, it might be very easy to lose some carbons or maybe accidentally add one or two here or there. So what am I going to do before I make these cuts? I will number every carbon in my molecule. And it doesn't have to be numbered, uh, you know, in a very uh, systematic way, like according to IPAC or anything like that. Those numbers are just my anchor points so that I can find all the same carbons in my final product. So when I get to my final product, which will look something like that, in this case I have three different pieces, I can find all the same carbons, I can trace all those carbons throughout my molecule, and this way I know that I have 13 carbons to begin with, I still have 13 carbons, and I can identify each of those carbons that came from the starting molecule to each of the pieces that I have in my final product. I said it before and I'm going to repeat it again, it's better to spend 5 seconds to number your molecule and make sure you don't lose anything than lose 5 points because you have an extra carbon in your final product. Get into a habit of numbering your atoms and I can guarantee it will save you more than once on your exams. So, what do you think about the ozonolysis reaction? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching till the very end. If you learned something new today, you can show this to me by hitting the like button or leaving a comment below. Subscribe to the channel for daily organic chemistry updates and tutorials. Watch this video next and I will see you tomorrow.